Hi, I'm Mike. Welcome to this uh, my my talk, uh, which is pre-recorded uh, in my in the corner of my flat, surrounded by uh, by Halloween stuff, uh, which is which is cool uh, and not related to the talk. Um, it's not going to be a particularly Halloweeny talk. Um, if anything, I think it's just going to be more of a ramble. Um, with these, we can of course cut things up and chop, so I can edit things however I want, uh, which would be fun. Uh, don't know if that works. It seemed like a good idea at the time, and now I'm, now I'm committed to it, uh, so we've got to go for it. Um, so who am I? I'm Mike, Mike Biffle. Uh, I'm a game developer. Um, I have been for quite a while. Um, I made a bunch of games. I shall display them on screen here, probably, or over here, maybe, or maybe both simultaneously. Um, and yeah, there's a bunch of them. Uh, Thomas Was Alone probably is the one people know me best for. Uh, that was a platforming game uh, with a bit too much story. Uh, and then we've done uh, stealth games, story games, VR games. Um, we've just done a game, uh, Solitaire Conspiracy, which is going really well for us, which is exciting. And we're just figuring out what we're going to do with that next and where we're going to go with it. So that's all very cool. Um, I get asked to do this kind of talk quite a bit um where where you know basically just kind of talking about what we've done what decisions we've made kind of how how things have gone and what we've learned the problem i always run into with them though is that uh most advice you're going to get at a conference or from someone kind of in my position where they've had a few successful games most of that advice can be out of date uh, because it happened in the past uh, and this industry is is changing so much all the time or it's it's tied very specifically to what that person's kind of situation was when they made the game. So you know, um, uh, you know things like privilege, but also kind of just uh, you know the success of one thing leading to another thing, leading to another thing, leading to another thing. It's all very well me saying to you, well, the the key to solitaire conspiracy was was getting so many wish lists because um, you know all all you simply have to do is is, is be on a podcast a lot or, or have a decent number of Twitter followers. And that's not super helpful. And that's always something that I've always kind of struggled with in those talks to kind of give meaningful... Sorry, there's pigeons outside my house. It just freaked me out there. I don't know if I'll cut that out, but it just weirded me out. I think it's the Halloween vibe is, is making me a little more edgy than normal. Or on edge. Yeah, on edge. Cool. Uh, so what I want to do instead is I want to talk about um, lessons like uh, approaches ways of thinking i think that's usually the more useful lesson uh so the way in which uh i think and the way in which kind of our company and the people around me kind of think and talk about problems and talk about uh what to do in terms of how our company set up in terms of what games we make how we make them um so going through some of those kind of thought processes and giving some examples of, of, of where they've worked or where they haven't worked um, but more just a bunch of kind of lessons learned in a more generalized way seems more useful rather than just saying, you know, do this specific business technique that worked in 2013. Uh, that seems more useful. Cool. Um, I don't know if this, I don't know if I'll number this um, or if it's a list. I'm just going to go through it. I've got my, uh, my notes in front of me. I've skillfully, this is lesson one, skillfully placed them just under the webcam so I can kind of avert my eye quickly to the notes um, as we go. Uh, hopefully that'll be useful. Um, and I might reorder them as well. So if my head moves drastically or I suddenly seem much more tired or my voice sounds more strained, it's probably because I've moved the order around. Um, let's see how we get on. Uh, this is all new to me doing this via video. Uh, it's strange and uncomfortable. Um, cool. So the, the first one, I think this kind of is a defining thing for us. And I think for a lot of indie games and indie game makers is finding an underserved audience. Um, so finding a space where no one else is or where uh, usually where a lot of people are in terms of players uh, but, uh, but but maybe there aren't many games or there aren't the kind of games they want um, and taking that opportunity quickly. Um, the problem is historically every example of this has kind of been a bubble. It's been a moment where there's been this great opportunity and then a few people have taken advantage of that opportunity done very well and then everyone else jumps in and suddenly it's it's overpopulated. Uh, so a really good example of this recently is the Switch. The Switch launched, didn't have an enormous amount of support, largely down to the Wii U kind of underperforming, so there weren't many games. Um, and those few indie games that were there from the start managed to turn that into an opportunity and kind of bring out, uh, you know, bring out games and, and, and sell lots of copies. 
because there weren't many games there. Of course, what happened was those uh, those games got written about, talked about. Indies, the rest of us, myself included, flocked to the platform with our games. Um, and of course, by that point, um, there was still you know there's still lots of opportunity there, but uh, the the kind of that 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 massive open space was gone. Um, and now things have steadied out a bit on the Switch store, and it's a, a bit more the kind of numbers you'd expect. Um, that's a really good historical opportunity, and that's a good illustration of what I'm talking about in terms of thinking about the thought process rather than the outcome. So not going, bring your game out on Switch, going, bring your game out wherever there is space. We've benefited directly from this in the past ourselves with Thomas Was Alone. Uh, we brought Thomas Was Alone out at a point in time where most AAA companies had moved away from PC. There weren't an enormous number of PC games coming out. Um, so a game like Thomas Was Alone came out and could be on the Steam front page for you know a couple of weeks because there was nothing else coming out. Um, and that worked really well for us and kind of found us an audience. Um, again, though, now, obviously, Steam's very heavily populated. That may be not the, the best opportunity, but finding those weird moments coming up um, where there's a space and going for those, that's a great way of emulating the success that other indies in the past have had elsewhere. Um, the places I don't know about, um, because, you know, my company is big and, and slow compared to what you'd be able to do. So finding those moments and those opportunities where no one else has spotted yet, uh, and jumping into those as a really, really cool thing to do. Next up, and this is maybe a bit controversial, um, don't crunch. Don't, don't, don't crunch. It's, it's really, it's really not very good. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's. I think, I think there is the generation it seems coming up gets this, which is amazing and saves us all a lot of trouble. Um, but don't crunch. Um, the numbers uh, in terms of productivity during crunch are appalling. Like. It's, it's a really bad way to make anything, um, even if you're working for yourself. Um, taking long breaks, taking weekends, demonstrably and provably gets you to make more work. Um, definitely, uh, if you're starting a team or starting a company, um, make it very much a goal from the start to not do crunch. Um, and stick to it and figure out ways around that. Uh, figure out flexibility in your schedules in other ways in terms of flexibility of scope, in terms of arranging for buffer time, in terms of you know, basically arranging space to breathe for your team. Um, it's the right thing to do, which is always a tough, a tough argument to make, but it's, it's always the best um, <laughs> place to start, is, is you shouldn't make people suffer for video games. That's very bad. Um, but also just from like a cynical point of view, it's, it's, it's a really uh, inefficient way to make anything. Um, all the data we've we've got from every study very clearly points out that crunch works usually for one to two weeks tops and then it crashes and then everything slows down uh, and you might as well not have bothered. Not only have you burned people out, got them sick, you know, kept them away from their families, uh, but you're also not making better or more product. So therefore you're not making more money either. So even, even if you are an awful human being who wants to make the people who work for you suffer, uh, even then, uh, it's a bad idea. Um, so yeah, uh, that's something that we've definitely always done. We've, we've messed up in the past. Um, not usually people working for us. We've, we're very strict about that. But I personally have, have always like struggled with working too many hours because I really like what I do. Um, when that's kind of piled on I've, I've kind of hurt myself in the past i've, I've uh, i ended up in a hospital uh, with heart palpitations while making um volume the stealth game um because i just wor was working too many hours and that was a real wake-up call for me um in terms of just like managing my time and making sure that i was living up to the principles i talk about you know i'm very kind of vocally anti-crunch and and putting those rules on myself as well uh, has been a big deal so that's another lesson we've learned is just don't do it just 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 you know manage your schedules and do a proper job and don't accept excuses in terms of uh in terms of when that goes wrong it's it's always a failure of management uh when crunch happens and that's you know that's a pretty controversial opinion that i have but i continue to have it and have not had it proven wrong to me yet so we'll see a big one uh that we we definitely have always benefited from is playing to your strengths uh so specifically uh trying to make games uh, that that play to what you and your team can do. What can you do well? And literally, there's there's no, no harm in sitting down and writing out a bullet point list. What are the things that you can do uh, really well? Um, and your game should probably be mostly about those things. 
uh, you know, what what can you produce? What's 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 excellent uh, and and cool that you can get done? Um, things that you can't do, uh, maybe avoid those, maybe uh, or, or manage them. Um, we we try our general rule uh, for us is we do kind of an eighty percent stuff we know we can do well, and then we'll squeeze in a twenty percent something new. Specifically because we want to obviously always be pushing ourselves forward, but we also, you know, it's really crucial to us that we, 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 we lean into what we can do. Uh, so a good example of that for us is we're, we know we're very good at story stuff uh, when we focus on it. We also know that we're very good at presentation, so we'll, we'll make games that are very pretty usually or, or very uh, stylized and, and have a cool vibe to them and good art direction. But... You know, we'll often push into areas where we're not as comfortable. So, uh, Solitaire, which we just did, leans heavily on kind of our comfort with doing kind of sci-fi stories and uh, cool art direction. But I'd never coded an art, a card game before, so it was that was the area where kind of I was pushing my skills uh, and exploring. Likewise with John Wick, we um, we knew we could do the movie side of that well. We knew we could do um, the style of it, and we knew we could make the interaction really interesting. Um, but there we wanted to make uh, something deeper, something more strategic, uh, which again was something we'd not done before. Uh, so we pushed in that area. Uh, volume, we had, uh, you know, we, we knew we could make fun action, fun stealth mechanics, uh, but we'd never done um, any kind of uh, leaderboards or user-generated content or anything like that. So that's where we pushed. So definitely lean into what you know um, and then find the little thing that's an interesting thing that you can push the team forward with. But there's no shame in making games that you can make. Um, and you don't need to constantly be innovating in those areas. You can find something to innovate in, but it's okay to, to really excel at something you're excelling at. And what's really cool is, is if you do that, um, those new skills can become the thing on the next project, which is a, a safe bet. Um, so, for example, John Wick, we did that strategic play. And then we all got much more comfortable making those kind of deeper interlocking strategic systems which meant that when we came to Solitaire, we were adding some of that stuff into Solitaire, which is what makes that version of the, you know, a game that's existed hundreds of years, um, more interesting. We, that's the that's the angle we added to that. Um, so we 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 kind of can keep growing as a team um, and as individuals. You know, it's it's very easy within these just kind of personify a game to one individual, but you've got a team. You've probably got several people working on something with you finding what each of you are already really good at and what you want to grow and get better at is is essential and we have a luxury at the smaller scale but we can really lean into that we don't have to think in that kind of big corporate way where we have to manage large teams we can go okay Suzanne's really good at this um we've never really used it in a game how can we make the game kind of explore that thing that, that she's really good at and and you know build up from there so another another important lesson I think uh, that, that that I've definitely learned over my career, and, and I think we definitely kind of do as a company, is 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 prioritizing kindness and prioritizing kind of not not uh, not leaning into the whole mean genius kind of trope, um, because it's tiring bluntly and and usually not worth it. Um, you know I'm incredibly happy and proud to work with. A bunch of just really good people who are there to, you know, build other people up and support other people and and, and find creative kind of solutions to problems together. Um, not a big fan of the whole Rick and Morty, Rick Sanchez kind of personality type. Um, there's no amount of intelligence that allows you to be nasty to people, um, and I've got very little patience for it definitely something I've encountered over my career and, and definitely something I've probably been guilty of earlier in my career but as 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 I've grown up basically um it's just boring and it, it shows a lack of um just emotional intelligence it's just not a nice kind of person to work with so as a company we try and encourage everyone to be kind of supportive and and good-hearted and I, I know it sounds a bit gooey but it's important I think it's something that definitely I wish had been prioritized to me earlier. I think it's very easily easy to fall into the assumption that um, we all have to just be really smart. And I think emotional intelligence and quote unquote soft skills are, if not more important than definitely as important. I would much rather train someone up uh, to be good at Maya um, than, than train someone up to be you know thoughtful of others. 
um, the, the first one seems easier, uh, and in my experience, generally seems to be uh, seems to be in most cases. There's base. I, I think the main point is that that the, no one's smart enough to be allowed to be a bad person in in my team, um, and to make anyone kind of feel feel bad about themselves or about what they what they're doing. Uh, obviously, criticism is a very different thing, and and that we we have to be very open with and kind of listen to and think about and and you know be comfortable criticizing each other's work. But I, I think you'll have encountered people who, who go beyond criticism and and into kind of a kind of smug. Uh, cruelty, uh, which is something that I think as an industry we just need to kind of get over venerating that kind of personality, um, and we have, uh, and that that seems to work well for us, and it goes a long way in terms of uh, again boring business reasons like retention, um, you know, keeping people around, people not wanting to to leave the first chance they get. Um, we have a we have a nice studio culture as a result of that. Um, and people tend to stick around, so it's it makes business sense as well to to not allow people to be awful to each other. Um, yeah. So this this next one is a little bit um, uh, it's like a self destruct sequence in any talk, which is which is don't listen um, to me um, <laughs> me specifically. No, um, the, the, the people people who would be asked to talk at conferences. Um, don't don't listen necessarily to those people. Um, I think there's obviously there's good wisdom always to be found from from your kind of uh, your your elders um, or your kind of your heroes or people you follow on social media. I think there's 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 often good stuff out in the ether. Um, but also I think there's a lot of nonsense. I think there's a lot of um, you know stuff that worked five, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago. Um, but is maybe, you know, that doesn't work so well now. And I think ultimately it's the job of every creative generation to come along and be punks and be a bit different and kind of challenge those status quos and ultimately kind of change things. We did, um, the generation before us did, and the next generation should. Uh, I think that's important. I think it's useful. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't have to listen to anyone. It means that maybe your peers are better. Um, this is something that I think... I often kind of say to students who I'm, I'm working with or talking to um, that usually their peers are going to be able to give them more insights. Uh, their peers are going to be more in touch with kind of the culture of the day. Um, their peers are building up their own careers. Uh, you can kind of grow together. Um, and you see this kind of, there's this weird generational thing, in, in especially in the games industry, actually, where groups of people came up together. You know, a lot of a lot of friends in the indie game space are friends because the games that blew up for them came out in the same year. So they were just whisked along at the same time, right? They were invited to the same special parties and the same uh, events and stuff and the same to uh, talking at, at conferences back when we would go somewhere uh, for those. Um, so they would so they would kind of get to know each other and, and you build up these kind of friendship groups. So you get these kind of strange time-locked peer groups um, I think that's a good thing. I think I think especially when you're starting out, uh, is to look around you and, and find the talented people around you and gravitate towards them uh, and learn from them and, and work with them and kind of build each other up. Um, that's that seems to be the way to kind of to kind of get things done. Um, and you generally kind of see communities happening and you see uh, kind of new spaces opening up because of that. So so spend less time hero worshiping, I guess, is the point of this a bit because uh, i know i'm i'm guilty of it all the time i'm, I'm i still geek out at, at when i meet people who i uh, love their work as a kid um and that's great and it's lovely and it's it's lovely to meet those people and to chat with those people and that's great but at the same time you know look to your peers look to the people around you who are doing exciting stuff right now um because there's maybe more to learn and more um direct experience that can kind of help you and support you uh, so don't listen to me. Turn off the rest of this and go and shout to some people, I suppose. Um, hmm. I, I, I think the next one, um, this might be a bit personal to me. I'm always really worried about showing off, which I know is hard to um, believe if you if you follow me on Twitter or um, you, you've seen me talk a lot. I don't really like um, to, to talk about our stuff, um, which but I do because I have to. And, and I do a lot. To, to, too much possibly like i quite i talk quite a bit um and i think i think that's a good thing and i think it's okay 
and I think this is weirdly something that definitely comes up with British devs a lot, and, and maybe maybe less so with 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 Americans and, and, and other countries. But um, definitely, there's a shyness about showing off, about declaring that you've made a thing, and letting people know about it, and kind of encouraging the audience to support it, or or you know, wishlist it, or, or buy it, or or tell their friends, and all this stuff. I think I think there can be a nervousness about about showing off. And I'm here to tell you, it's it's worth it. <laughs> like like, it's okay. It's okay to feel that way, and it's normal to feel that way. But at the same time, like having the nerve to show off your stuff and share it, um, ultimately is is you know the point, right? It's it's. Don't know if you can hear that. There's a drill going off next door. It sounds like it's in the wall. I'm leaving this in. over you done this happens about once a day for about two minutes i'm gonna stop recording come back no i don't know what i don't know what it is i don't know if it's a smoothie maker because it doesn't it's never for very long which implies to me that he's not doing like a big job um I think he's done i think so so yeah um don't 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 worry about showing off um it's 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 something we all have to do we have to promote our work um th there's ways of doing it right and wrong there's ways of going too far with it and annoying people but um generally yeah if you're someone who, who who's a little bit awkward about doing that stuff it's okay it's okay to do it and it's and it's it's kind of how you are going to be able to kind of support you know your team in making more stuff um, if you're the person who has to kind of go up on stage, and it's okay to ask for help with it as well. Um, if you're ever at a point where um, a publisher or a platform holder is is wanting you to do that kind of stuff and go on stage or whatever, it's okay to ask them to help you out with that. Like it's it's there there are there are professionals uh, who can turn any of us into a into a competent public speaker, um, and usually quite patient. I guess I guess the final one. Um, I wanted to mention uh, today is is uniqueness is is making stuff that's unique to you. This is similar to doing what you're good at, um, which was uh, earlier on. Um, probably I, I might move these things around. I think I think it was earlier. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, being being unique, being yourself, making the kind of stuff that, that only you can make. You know what what are the what are the things that only you can make. That's a really interesting thought to have, and again, of course, if you're if you're on a team, you know what are the things that people on the team can make? What are they interested in? Um, I think often we think of these things as like big innovations, big kind of moments, you know, where you're you're walking through the mountains and an idea appears in your head and it's the greatest idea ever found. Most of the time, that's not where the kind of the stuff that's particularly exciting comes from. Usually, uh, it's someone who has a weird interest um you know they're into something that most people who make and play games aren't into or something where um they're you know they've, they've combined two things that have never been combined before uh, and found something cool as a result of that um that's valid that's innovation that's that's originality um with, for us uh, good examples of this would be um solitaire conspiracy actually is a good example where we looked at solitaire games and we looked at what they looked like and, and how they felt and we realized they were all fantasy or kind of historical uh, fiction. And we thought, well, we could just do sci-fi. Um, and that's not really been, been done with Solitaire as much. Um, there's examples, but like, you know, it's not, it's not as common. Um, spies were a way of doing that as well. That was, again, like, there, why are there no Mission Impossible style spy stories or James Bond style spy stories? Uh, we didn't know that James Bond was going to be delayed, uh, <laughs> but uh, but we, we knew that, that that was something maybe people would be interested in and, and it kind of seems to have paid off. And that's simply because we combined a couple of things that hadn't been combined before. Now, none of those ideas in individually are innovative, but the combination of them made something that stood out. Um, but you can actually do much more interesting stuff. Um, most most people who make games have something they're obsessed with, which is a bit rarer to be obsessed with. So I'm a I'm a theatre nerd. Um, I love musicals. Um, I've been dying to make a musical game. I'll do it one day. 
Um, chorus looks cool. I'm seeing that one coming up a lot from uh, from a few of my buddies. Um, the the so that would be an interesting thing. If I brought that in, that would immediately make a, a game feel different, and it'd be something that 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 only I or a small number of people who are into something like that would would be able to do. Similarly, um, I'm into theme parks. I've always wanted to do something with theme parks in a game. Um, which of course there are games about theme parks, but I, I think there's you know less of them, and there's maybe interesting new angle you could bring to it. So it doesn't have to be this great artistically um, valid thing that you're you know about. It doesn't need to be something kind of highfalutin or high culturally. Um, it can be something just different, something that you're into that you know no one else seems to be into, or that there's never been a game about, or or that the, these kind of unique opportunities. And again your team will probably have different different interests so maybe you can mash those up in ways that are interesting and i think if you look at a lot of the games especially indie games that have done really well it's been that it's been that they've either combined a couple of things that have never been combined before or that it's just a really unique take on something there are less examples of indie games where they've done really well that were just better versions of other games um the the other thing is is we are actually more free to do this in the indie space than than in AAA. Um, this is something, this is a lesson we definitely learned on volume. Volume, we did a lot of promotion on that that felt a bit more AAA leaning. So we were doing, you know, we did the big kind of, I went on stage at the PlayStation Gamescom event and showed a, a cool trailer. Um, but it wasn't as cool as like a big AAA um, action game. So therefore, it didn't really appeal to that audience and it wasn't unique or special enough uh, to appeal to an indie audience. So that trailer kind of fell between a couple of stools. Volume did well in the end, but it was it was definitely weirdly marketed in retrospect to kind of this kind of middle ground. We could have played into what was unique about the game or unique about us um, instead of, of trying to emulate kind of a, a more traditional kind of approach. Um, so that really, finding that uniqueness and finding that, that specialness uh, that makes sense. It's similar to the playing to your strengths point, but I think it's slightly different in the playing to your strengths is kind of a conservative position where you're kind of being careful and, and doing stuff that you know you can do. This is more um, playing to the things that you would not necessarily think were, the, were obvious ideas for games, but that you know about and that you have an interest in, or a cultural experience that you have that's unique, uh, that stands out. A bunch of different things that you, that you can draw on that will make a game that only you and your team could make. And that's a great way to, to make something original. And that's some, that's some lessons. So hopefully, I mean, where possible, I've kind of pulled them back to things about us. And maybe this isn't the kind of career retrospective talk um, that, that we were planning originally, but I hope it's useful. I, 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 my goal is to kind of hopefully uh, give, give stuff that, that's more applicable than just, hey, make a, make a game about rectangles in 2012, you know? Um, that's, hopefully that's kind of done its job. Um, thank you so much uh, for watching. Um, I've been Mike. Um, the, the guy with the drill has stopped uh, for another day. I look forward to that again tomorrow for five minutes. One day I'll go over and ask him what he's doing. I'm just, just out of curiosity um, or, or interest. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for listening. And uh, hit me up on Twitter if, if anything I've said is confusing or weird or stupid. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, probably. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference and, uh, and this event. So thank you so much and uh, look after yourselves. Cheers.